Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, an extended version of Home Tech. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of extra clips this uh, on this episode, this special extended episode uh, for, from Jason over at ISE 2017. Yeah, and, and we use the word a couple loosely. We have uh, a lot of ground we covered over at ISE, and, and as we mentioned on our episode last week, uh, we wanted to make sure we got all of these out there. And so we decided to put uh, a number of these into a bonus episode here. And we're just going to roll these back to back. Um, and we hope you enjoy. Thanks so much for tuning in. I am here with Ricky Suzuki from Sony. She is the product manager of this ultra short throw projector. Ricky, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for taking a minute to chat with me and uh, tell us about this Sony uh, short throw projector here. Okay, sure. Uh, so this is our new ultra 4K short throw projector and it's using laser light source and the brightness is 2500 lumen and it is a 4K native XX30 panel and also it support HDR. Great. Well, it's a very, very cool unit. I know you guys had a, a short throw projector mm -hmm. before this, but yeah. I, if I understand correctly, this one is mm -hmm. a little bit less expensive and, and yes. maybe easier to install. Tell us about that. Okay. Yeah. It's a uh, more affordable because our previous one, uh, BPL ZTZ one, uh, was uh, five uh, fifty thousand USD, I okay. guess. And that uh, this is now in US uh, twenty five thousand. Wow. So yeah. Half the price. Yeah. Half the price. And also it's a uh, smaller. So it's about like 40 percent smaller in volume and uh, it's brighter and also it's easy to install because we have a syst lens assist function right now got it mm -hmm. got it and what is the uh, the availability of the unit okay the shipping will start uh, from april this year okay great mm -hmm. and then last question i know right now you guys are showing it built into a custom console that mm -hmm. lives below mm -hmm. uh, the screen can this yeah. unit also be ceiling mounted yeah we can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I appreciate you taking a minute to chat with me and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you very much. All right. All right. I've stopped by the uh, Control 4 booth here to chat with Brad Hinsey. Brad, how's it going? It's going great. Good. Good. You guys' booth is uh, probably the busiest one I've seen so far. Yeah. We like to hear that. Impressive, <laughs> impressive crowd here. And so yep. I appreciate you taking a few minutes to... Uh, to chat with me. Um, obviously, we, we spoke at right coming off of Cedia, and, and we've been talking quite a bit about you guys lately. But um, but tell us what's new. I, or let, let's start with you know we're here in Amsterdam, yeah. right? And so there's obviously some unique things about uh, the European market. And so tell me how that market is for Control Four. Maybe what some of the unique challenges are that you see right, uh, in serving this market. So you know, as you know, we're we are truly a worldwide company. Yep. You know, we have the biggest concentration in the U.S., but we are direct in uh, the U.K and direct in Germany, where we are interfacing with dealers directly. Uh, we have distributors in the other countries around that too. So this show is a really important one for us to interact with the dealers that we're working with directly, yep. but also as a, as a platform for our distributors to meet with their uh, dealers in their individual territories sure, as sure. well. Sure. And so speaking of the European market, I know one of the newer things that you guys are, are showing here, I believe, is a, the European uh, lighting control. Yeah. Yes. Talk about that. Yeah. So in, in some ways, you know, we're U.S. based. We've got a great lighting line in the U.S. And last year we introduced our square wireless lighting. Yep. Uh, this year we're augmenting that line with two additional products. It's a dual load dimmer and a dual load switch. Uh, so you can control two independent, uh, two loads of lighting independently yep. in the same box, back box. You know, really useful for Mia and for APAC as well. Sure, yeah. sure. Another thing I know that you guys are showing here that's unique to this market uh, overseas for U.S. listeners is uh, voice control. Yeah. Huge topic coming yeah. out of Cedia. What do you guys have going on for here? So we announced uh, Amazon Alexa support for the UK English. You know, we'd, we'd laugh about it. The Queen's English. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we, you know, we got a lot of requests from customers over here um, when we announced in the US at Cedia. And so there's been a lot of pent up demand to get that. So we're, we're glad to finally have that awesome. as well. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So one other thing I wanted to ask, actually new news since Cedia. Yeah. Coming out of Cedia for me, one of the biggest stories there was uh, what we started calling RSM, remote systems management, network monitoring. There's a lot of different terms for it. Obviously yeah. you guys are a, a player in that space now with Backpack. and and a, a new recent release, uh, sort of baking that product into uh, some, some other products. So give us an overview of that. Yeah, so uh, Backpack is now included on the RK1 router. It's our high-end, high-performance router. 
the, what we're trying to do here is really make it easier for a dealer to bring all of their customers into Backpack. Uh, I think, all, I mean, really one of the challenges that some of these remote management tools have had is getting enough critical mass on the tool yep. that a dealer finds value in using it for all of their customers. Because if you have four or five or six different tools, you've got one or two customers here and one or two customers there, it's not a very useful tool. So um, by including it now in the router, every home needs a router. Right. So now all of those homes could bring in Backpack. And, and we really want to make Backpack that ubiquitous standard for a dealer uh, working with packaged products. You know, make them more effective and not worry about folding that into the cost of doing business. It's right. just there for them and, and use it to keep your customers happy and, and be more efficient. You got it. All right, Brad, well, I really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to chat with me. I'll let you get you back bet. to work here and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks a lot, Jason. All right. Great Thank to you. see you. All right, I have stopped by the uh, the contact booth here to talk with Yaniv. Uh, Yaniv, I was telling you, we posted some pictures of these products on Twitter yesterday and, and of all the tweets I sent out, this one got, got some attention, so I wanted to stop back by and, and chat with you a little bit to learn learn more so so uh, before we dive into some of the specifics here talk about contact what is your guys' company all about great first of all thank you for stopping by uh, contact is a manufacturer of smart home devices and uh, we do it for uh, almost uh, 15 years at uh, the past uh, two years we started manufacturing uh, z-wave products and uh, naturally when Apple uh, announced uh, to go in, inside the home uh, automation area, we uh, started developing the home kit. Started uh, looking at home kit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're we're going to jump into that in, in just a second. Yeah. Generally, your guys' display here, obviously people are listening and they can go check out pictures on our website, but but talk about these these keypads. I mean, there, is that even what you call them, keypads? Is that a proper term? These are a, a touch panels. It's more of a touch panel, act right? as a keypad because we have uh, relays inside. But uh, uh, the most um, interesting, thing, interesting thing in our product is that they are fully customized. So I can take uh, the customer's desire and put it in, inside the, the touch panel design. Yep. Uh, we can use any material you want. Uh, we can uh, make a, a glass uh, designs in any, uh, any design, any color, any graphic design. We can write an uh, indication and enlighten them. We can use icons and enlighten them. We can use natural materials such as marble or uh, wood or any stone you want. And, and, and gold, right? Yes. You guys uh, had somebody stop have, by yesterday. Uh, Tell us that story. We, have, we had someone here from Bahrain. He wanted a special touch panel with solid gold. <laughs> and it was his demand. So we gave him the solution of, of a solid gold a touch panel with a unique design. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And that's what we do. This is our uh, value proposition, a, a unique, customized touch panel for every customer. They're, they're very, very cool. And again, we'll, we'll include some pictures up on our website. Uh, but lastly, I want to go back to your comment about HomeKit. And yeah. obviously that, that caught my eye here, and, and that, I think, was really the main thing when I tweeted this out. Some people were very interested in that. Clearly, there's a lot of interest in, in HomeKit. What drove your guys' decision uh, to get in, you know, to get into that technology. Uh, it's a simple decision. If if Apple there, we want to be there also. Uh, we believe uh, that they will make a good job uh, in yeah. marketing the technology, and uh, we want to take that wave and uh, enjoy the sure. uh, enjoy the ride. <laughs> sure. Well, we'll we'll look forward to seeing how you guys can do, and uh, yeah. I really really do appreciate. We are you. going to exhibit our products at uh, San Diego, uh, the CD show oh, in great. September. We'll be there with a the big booth. Uh, we'll be able to see every product that we make and all the Wonderful. technologies. Uh, I'll look forward to stopping to by. Yeah, I'll pleasure. let you get back to it. I appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to chat Thank with me. Thank you very much. Jeff. All right, take care. Great. All right, I've stopped by the uh, Stewart Film Screen booth here, and I'm chatting with Vegeta. How are you? I'm great. How are you Good. doing? Good. Are you enjoying Amsterdam? I am. This is my second time here in Amsterdam, and great. I love it. Yeah, it's an awesome show. So I just wanted to make sure to stop by here and check you guys out. I am uh, have worked with Stewart before. I'm a, a fan of what you guys do, and, and I know you've got this new uh, Phantom screen over here, so very high ambient light rejecting screen. 
Um, there, there's a lot we can go into on that screen, but start by telling us about some of the unique things. I know one of them is how, how large you guys are able to make this screen size. Yes, so Phantom Hailer actually can go up to 40 feet by 90 feet on the material because we make it in-house as your home screen. Which is, uh, I understand, a, you know, that, that size is, is a limitation on a lot of competitive uh, ambient light rejecting screens. Yes, most of the competitors can only do a set fixed size um, due to the semi-rigid substrate that they use. Right. Right. So you mentioned um, that, that semi-rigid substrate. I know one of the other unique things about this screen uh, versus other ambient light rejecting screens is that it can actually be rolled up. Talk about that. Yes. So this screen material is a flexible material, so it's capable of being um, installed in all of our electric screen enclosures. Okay. Great. And then obviously with video these days, huge topic, 4K, HDR. I know a lot of people, when they think about that technology, they're gonna think first maybe about the projector in that two-piece setup, but the screen has a very important role uh, to play in that as well. And so talk about how the Phantom screen uh, fits into the, the HDR picture. No problem. Now, the most important thing is you remember, you're looking at the screen itself. So you don't want the screen to do any color shift or any sort of aberrations to that film that you're watching right there. So our screen material, the uniformity is perfect. And also it's able to handle the HDR, UHD, and if you're calibrating Rec. 709 or Rec. 2020 even. Great. Very important, obviously, in, in a theater, any theater, yes. but particularly in a high-end theater, which I'm sure you guys go into a lot of. Um, so speaking of an installation, I know you've got some new uh, enclosures. Talk about that. Um, we've got a new enclosure called the Torrent, and the other enclosure is called the Stealth XM. Um, both of them are easy for integration because of the new redesign. They are smaller housing, and also the electronics are now located on the inside, the control system of the case. That's great. So you can easily access them. So no more, no more uh, uh, boxing the control system behind drywall, and then exactly, <laughs> and then having to cut it out and yeah, getting upset over I'm that. I'm sure are, are happy to hear that. And I know you showed me some of the new um, sort of ways these can be mounted and things like that. So it's really, it's good. It's good to hear that you're thinking about that. Um, very important for the for the install community. So one more question here, I want to talk about. I know we come to these trade shows and we talk a lot about video, and and that's always a, a, a big topic, of course. Um, a lot of attention being paid these days to OLED, uh, new display technology, so people getting very excited about these TVs. Um, talk about the relevance and the importance of, uh, of two-piece projection in today's world and why you still think it's important. So the importance of two-piece projection is that the director who created the movie made it a specific aspect ratio, say 235. If you're watching it on two-piece projection, you can have a screen with masking, start at 235, and then you can close it down to 16 by 9 if you have some other content to watch. OLEDs don't allow you that. You right. have a set fixed aspect ratio, and it's going to have black bars if it has to mask down on that piece of technology. The other nice thing is, and the cinema is about a big screen experience. You want to see that film on a large screen. And it has a more cinematic feel to it, film-like feel to it, when you're sitting there in a theater with a curtain opening up and the projector turning on. OLED doesn't give you that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I've, I've sat in a lot of nice media rooms, and I've also sat in a lot of nice two-piece projection rooms. And uh, there's just something different about projection, I think a little more engaging and, like you said, more cinematic. So. Yes. All right, well, listen, I'll let you get back to the booth here. I appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to chat with me and enjoy the rest of your show. Thank you so much. I All appreciate right. it. All right, I'm here with Tom from uh, Basalt. Tom, how's it going? Good, good, good. It's been very busy so far. Yeah, yeah, great. You guys have a beautiful booth here as always. No, no surprise there. Yeah, we tried our best. It's, uh, design is very important for us, so yeah. uh, we want to put this yeah. in everything, also in the booth. Yeah, exactly. So you guys really obviously very well known for high quality design on your keypads, and I, I'm a big fan of of what you guys do from that angle, but uh, just wanted to stop by and kind of learn, you know, what you guys have going on that's new. And uh, I understand there are some uh, some advances in, in the way that uh, integrators over over on my side of the pond in the U.S. can can now integrate your system a little more. Um, I don't want to say smoothly, but a little more seamlessly with uh, with uh, Crestron. Yeah, so definitely. Talk about that. Yeah, so we we already had our keypads uh, in Europe in the KNX integration, but especially in the U.S., have a very strong position of Crestron and Lutron uh, as a system. So we already had our uh, design keypads, so really made of high quality materials, uh, available uh, in an RS485 integration. Yep. Uh, for Crestron and Lutron, and now at ISE we also show the direct Crestnet integration. So this should make the integration a lot more. Uh, 
directly because we won't need the serial link. It's kind of an interface. Yeah, yeah. So you guys have that additional piece of hardware, that serial link interface that allows us, has already allowed us to tie it in with, with ResNet and Lutron. Yeah, now definitely. you've got a direct ResNet integration. Yeah, definitely. And for the Lutron integration, why we need the serial link is because our keypad has some unique functionalities, especially the multi-touch to quickly turn the lights on and off, uh, right. but also to be able to integrate this in Lutron using the Phantom keypads. Yeah, well, it makes, you know, it makes a beautiful uh, front end for mm -hmm. like a Lutron lighting control system, so I definitely see the value in that. And it's really straightforward as well regarding integration. We're now selling the RS485 integration for about a year and a half now. We're getting some very good feedback, not only regarding design, but also the integration and how's it going. Good. And even though we're in Belgium, we have local reps, and we can also ensure that you have proper technical support as well. No, it's very important. So, uh, very important. So one of the big things I saw leading up to the show is uh, something that I actually have to admit thought was kind of a brand new thing for you guys is audio, audio solutions. I understand actually you've been doing this for a little while now, but you've just advanced that kind of to the next level. So just give us an overview of uh, Basalt's audio offerings and what you guys are doing now. Yep, and maybe uh, important to mention is why we started with audio. So we we do have our keypads that we already sell for quite a while now, for about eight years. Uh, we also have our design iPad mounts. Um, but especially regarding audio, we wanted to uh, broaden the, the Basalt experience. We, we always focus on the combination of design and quality of materials, yep. but also comfort in use and user experience. What we've seen is from our experience in Europe then specifically, uh, is that uh, the KNX, the Global Standard for Home Automation, didn't have a proper, fully KNX integratable uh, multi audio solution that also offers the audio quality that especially higher end residential projects look for. Right. So that's why we made uh, already two years ago now, we already had our uh, multi room amplifiers directly integrating in KNX. And what we now show here at ISE is our music server and also right. some additional uh, features to integrate active speakers but also um, surround amplifiers. Yeah. Yeah, well, it all looks great. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me, and uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Thank you, and uh, right. thanks, thanks for stopping by. Bye. It. All right, I'm joined here by Alex Capasolatro of Josh AI. Alex, welcome to Amsterdam. Thank you. It's uh, a crazy show. It's great yeah, to be here. Tons of energy here. Very exciting. So happy to be sitting down with you. Uh, to chat. Now, I understand you've had a busy year. You've done quite a few of, of these shows. Is that right? It's been a nonstop year. I think I've been home about three days so far. Wow. Which is crazy. You know, CES kicked us off, gave a, gave a talk there. Um, here in Amsterdam, we've got ProSource Summit coming up in March. Wow. And then lots of customer meetings, so it's been great. Busy. That's great. So speaking of ISE here, you guys are doing a couple of, uh, you're doing one talk and one course, I believe. Tell us quickly about those. Yeah, so I'm giving a talk tomorrow. It's called How Humans Will Interface Technology in the Year 2020, which is really a look towards the future, you know, three, four years out. And then teaching a course on Thursday, which is all about integrating voice control for the whole home. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I look forward to uh, attending at least one of those. Um, let's talk about Josh AI. I know you guys have been really busy. Um, one of the big stories that we saw recently was sort of a revamped pricing structure. Give us the rundown of that. Sure. So we've always had this pricing structure where the dealer basically has a dealer price that they can buy and sell, typical you know model that we see in the industry. But we've been getting a lot of requests to see about a lower buy-in and then a monthly recurring revenue model. Yep. And so we're introducing a new model where the dealer has the option of either selling sort of the full price and then making money on the hardware, or they can do a lower price, you know, get customers that maybe don't want to buy in at the full amount, and then they share in that monthly recurring model. Okay, so that'll be a like a recurring monthly thing for the owner, and then the integrator and Josh AI are going to have some sort of split on that revenue. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Um, also wanted to ask you about uh, the demo program. You and I were talking about that a little bit here before we hit record. I thought that was interesting, so tell us about that. Yeah, so we have a program specifically for dealers who are looking for a demo unit, often for their own home or their showroom. And part of that is we fly out, we do in-person training, we really want to get our partners on board. Yep. And that's been nonstop every week. It's been about three cities and awesome. you know, all over. That's great. So, uh, last couple of questions here. I want to talk about? Let's talk about hardware first. So, I'm hearing rumors of some some Josh AI uh, hardware, basically. And, and I know you guys aren't necessarily prepared to divulge all of the details on that. But what can you tell us? Yeah. So, we're working on a lot of things. Hardware is one of those, and we're hoping to announce a new product at CDS. So, towards the end of the year. I can't go into details yet, but we're pretty excited about what it gotcha. is. So just a little teaser here. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Um, also, drivers. I know my partner uh, here on the podcast, Seth Johnson, has been 
uh, working with you guys on a Control 4 driver, I believe. I think you also mentioned Savant. Give us the overview of what you guys are doing in the, in the driver uh, space. Exactly. So we've had the Crestron driver out for a little while now. Um, but new is a Crestron DM driver that we're just about to release pretty soon. Oh, wow. Um, which is something we're very excited about. Uh, Seth has helped us out with the Control 4 driver, which is now live in a number of homes. Yep. And so that's helping us grow. And then Savant's the new one that we're working on as well. Awesome. Well, congratulations on all that. It sounds like you guys are, are doing great, and uh, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me here. Yeah, thanks, All right, Jason. enjoy the show. See you, Tim. I'm here with Stuart from Ahiji. Stuart, how's it going? It's going great. Good. Welcome to Amsterdam. Yeah, you Enjoying well. the show so far? <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, been really good. Awesome. Well, I know actually just before this uh, interview here, you came back from uh, teaching a course here. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, I had a full morning course uh, with uh, participants working through creating the client care plans, trying to, to grow their business towards recurring revenue. Um, one of the big themes and the takeaways that I really focused with the uh, with participants on was laying the foundation for recurring revenue actually has nothing to do with recurring revenue. Uh, really helped them to think through their businesses, what challenges they had structurally in order to be ready to have a more efficient and profitable service department, which then immediately allows you to start working towards recurring revenue as step two. Or as I right. told them, step zero is what I just talked about, and step one is starting yeah. recurring revenue. So sort of building the foundation first. Yep. And so yeah, we, we workshopped through it, and you know the goal was, and I believe everybody said they that we achieved it, is they had something tactical they were going to take back to their business next week, and improve their service department. That's great. And uh, and then email me over the next weeks, months, years, uh, tell me both their wins and their losses, and I plan to share that back uh, through you and others as well. Because right. yeah, sharing those successes and failures is the only thing that's going to help uh, you know, others. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of service plans and RMR, this this conversation in the industry, I feel like has, has reached a new uh, level. And I'm just curious to know your perspective on that. Do you, do you perceive the same thing? And, and if so, how have you seen that translating into the business of selling remote monitoring uh, solutions? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, it's, it, it's grown uh, immensely over, well, the seven years that I've been in it, this last year has been uh, one of the, the most precipitous uh, changes in the market and the perception. I think people now understand more about what uh, recurring revenue and, and better service, improved service really is. Yep. Um, and much to what I just pointed out, that service plans don't have to necessarily be recurring revenue um, at the first, um, as well as the concept of starting easy and evolving over time. Sure. Not trying to jump off of the biggest building first. Just jump up one stair yeah, yeah. and put your, uh, put your toes in the water. Yeah, try again. <laughs> right. So yeah, a couple other quick questions here. I know you guys have uh, a new hardware appliance since the last time that you and I spoke yeah. at Cedia. So give us the overview of the App 750, I yes. believe. Yes. Yeah. So the App 750 is, a, is our new replacement hardware. It can go in 100% of all the jobs that, that are done. You no longer have a bifurcation based on uh, performance. Uh, so you guys are, are reducing it down to just this one yes. skew. Yeah, that's correct. So this, this one low-cost SKU uh, should be installed at every one of the client's homes, and it provides the baseline uh, functionality for uh, for both the improved service as well as the recurring revenue service. Um, you know, it's a really great piece of hardware in addition, even though it's, it's rather invisible. You know, we took the time listening to customers about having screw-on power, for example, right. so that uh, you don't have that, that case when... It's in the rack upside down and the yeah. power falls out. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a nice it's a nice piece of hardware. Yeah, thank you um, very much. I don't know, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I don't know if you have more on the hardware, but I wanted to make sure we touch on because this is a message I I got, but I feel like maybe got missed coming out of Cedia. Mm. It has to do with your guys' new uh, pricing structure. Yeah. And really that that free tier where there's no yep. recurring licensing. So so talk about that, the reasoning behind mm -hmm. why you guys decided to go that route as well. Yeah, so we made a, a big switch. We listened to how the integrators were working through the process of, of, of the journey towards uh, a lot of recurring revenue. And again, it started with this foundational piece. Uh, the problem with the foundation was they didn't get paid for it, or they're not getting paid for it. Um, and so we ended up aligning, we created two service levels. So for every single site, you get to pick whether you're in what we call the light service level or the standard. Light service is focused with the features of reactive, uh, but not proactive service being included. Right. Um, so for example, we are monitoring the uh, WAN performance, telling you what the ISP speeds are, and we allow you to do the remote troubleshooting, the remote reboots and resets of uh, 
IP power distribution units, PoE units, yep. uh, soft cycles, all of those things, that's all included with no uh, growth of, of recurring revenue. So, so for that light tier, you're basically buying the hardware, one-time fee, yep. and then it's free to use, and that's you get all that, all that sort of, like you said, reactive troubleshooting, which, yep. is, which is pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean, the, the industry has commoditized power cycling, um, especially in the U.S. with uh, Snap AV and Blue Bolt and all of these others. It's it, it's a commodity, so we realized that we should just give away all the things that are commodities and keep the special stuff behind the behind the wall. Yeah. And those more advanced functions are the ones that you're going to get paid for as an integrator right. uh, because they should be involved in the higher end service plan. So we aligned our incentive structure such that we get paid only when you get paid rather than us always getting paid, which is the way it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, a, that was a huge barrier. So now with that you know, small increase of hardware cost and a lot of dealers are just bundling it in at cost because yeah. there's no need to make money. It's a foundational thing. Um, they can provide this really high level of customer service um, with no real functional changes to their business. Um, and it's, it's just really prime for, uh, for disrupting. We have dealers, we have some dealers who are barely, barely using the advanced functionality yep. and have no intentions to for many months as they, yeah. as they stabilize their business and, and improve things. And we're really satisfied with that. But yeah. because of the way our relationship works, we uh, spend a lot of time with our account managers working with our accounts to find out what's the next step, what's the next hurdle because we need them eventually over the long haul. We want them to move up in service. So we've again lined our incentives. We want to work with them to make their businesses more profitable right. so that we can in turn become more profitable. Got it. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes okay. to chat with me and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thanks, Stuart. All right, I'm over here at the Lutron booth with Sam. Sam, how's it going? It's going very well. It's an exciting and busy show. Uh, we've been coming to ISE for a long time. It's really good to be back. It's buzzing here today. Yeah, yeah, it's a great show. It's my first time here and uh, really enjoying Amsterdam and, and really having a lot of fun at the show. So I, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me. I'm sure you're super busy here, but just wanted to catch up with Lutron. We're very big fans of the company uh, back home. We, we talk about Lutron quite often, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to chat with you and learn about some of the things that maybe are a little bit different. Absolutely. Absolutely. over here across the pond oh, than, than they to are Europe. in the States. Thank you so much. So first, let's talk about one thing that um, I, I don't think is, is unique to the European market, but new to Lutron, and that's the Palladium thermostat. Right? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, your listeners will be familiar with Homeworks, and we've added into that range to complement the Palladium keypads, we've got a Palladium thermostat. So we've got that wonderful aesthetic styling that Palladium brings in glass, metal, or plastic, and now we've got a great user interface for uh, heating and ventilation control. Yeah. It's got a hot set point, it's got a cold set point, it's got the wonderful dynamic backlight management technology that uh, the Palladium system has. Uh, large buttons, large screen, easy to use, and it looks great. Yeah, it uh, the Palladium line is really a nice, a nice looking product, and and I think uh, very important, obviously, for the market that that installers are serving, custom installers and Lutron. Uh, we really have to appease the uh, the designers, right, and the homeowners, and make sure that we're putting in products that that match the aesthetic of, of the current home. And I think Palladium is a great a great example of that. You're absolutely right, and as you say, it ticks all the boxes for interior design. As you've got uh, the the options of the the various different finishes, the various different colors, uh, and it doesn't look techy. To an end user, right. it doesn't look difficult to use, uh, and of course, like like the C Touch as well, the buttons are all backlit, so you can find it in the dark, yep. which is really important for lighting controls. Yep. So let's talk about another thing that, that not necessarily unique uh, to the European market, but but newer. We've had it, I think, for maybe a little bit longer in the states, and you guys are just getting it here. And that is, of course, Echo integration, Amazon Alexa integration. So I understand you guys have that now over here, and, and how's that going for you? Absolutely, we do. We absolutely love Alexa. Uh, and speaking personally, it revolutionizes the way you live. Uh, great system, and so it's now fantastic that we can do scene control from uh, um, from Alexa to homeworks so you just say uh, Alexa turn good morning on and, right uh, and there we go so that's that's great it's it's adding to the range of different user interface options that we have uh, and so um, it's uh, it makes things convenient we're all about pleasance we're all about getting people's uh, experience in the home to be as good as possible and this is another string to our bow definitely definitely so one thing that is is unique to the European market that I've seen a lot of I've talked to a number of different lighting control companies here and you just sort of see it all over the place you've got 
uh, you know, the DIN rail enclosures, and you and I kind of talked about that before we uh, started recording here, and I'll, I'll post a picture up of, of the Homeworks QS on the DIN rail, which I thought was cool to see. As an American, we just don't have that. But another thing that I've seen a ton of over here is Dolly, and that's really has this really has to do with addressable lighting, and I know in the States, um, our Lutron rep, at least where I work, has been talking about uh, Lutron ecosystem, which I understand is sort of a similar thing. Certainly there are some differences there, but just talk generally about this idea of addressable lighting and how the intelligence and lighting control uh, is starting to make its way maybe out of the panel and yeah. into the kind of the fixtures themselves. Absolutely, yes. There are there are a few key technical differences between uh, ecosystem and Dali. Ecosystem has some some additional capabilities, but over here, Dali, the digital addressable lighting interface, is a protocol that's been around for about a decade and a half now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's got a, a lot of following over here. It's extensively used. The idea is this, back in the old days, you used to have um, uh, light sources that were hot bits of wire and you'd have uh, powerful dimmers all enclosed in a panel or in a rack that would do the heavy lifting of doing the, the dimming of those fixtures. Well, times are changing, times have changed, and it's typical now to find that the, the clever, so to speak, uh, is now incorporated in the drivers uh, for the fixtures, typically LED drivers. And so rather than receiving a chopped up mains uh, sine wave to give them the amount of power according to how bright you want them to be. Yep. Instead, you feed them with a constant main supply and then this um, two-wire digital control system that allows you to talk to uh, the, the zones of lighting that you want to talk to whilst up to 64 ballasts or drivers are all connected together. And so you can rezone very easily. And so the dimming equipment that used to be in the panel is now replaced by a clever DIN rail module and the dimming feature itself is handled by the drivers distributed throughout the building. So it's kind of a movement out of the panels and risers and into right. the ceilings. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, concept and, and one I think that uh, might take a little bit of time to wrap your brain around, but once you sort of understand what, what the idea is behind these addressable uh, lighting control uh, schemes, I think it's very interesting and I do anticipate that becoming a, a more common in lighting control. Would you agree with that? I would certainly agree. There's loads of benefits to it. There's the flexibility, there's the fact that you can rezone from software rather than having to pull any different cables. In terms of cable installation, uh, you're using less cable uh, and as the price of copper continues to rocket, uh, that's, a, that's a huge benefit. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's easy, it's flexible, uh, it's, a, it's a great choice and it frees up rack space as well. Yeah. Yeah, so last question, I understand you're based in London and you were telling me that uh, Lutron's getting ready to open a big experience center over there. Tell us a little bit about that. That's right, Lutron's new European uh, experience center in London. Very exciting, it's opening uh, very shortly, just a few weeks time. We will have all of our products on display there from residential through to our hospitality products, the My Room guest room system, our commercial products in Quantum. Uh, we've also uh, built a training center there so we'll be able to take more people in. Lutron loves teaching people about all aspects of light, lighting and lighting control uh, and so we'll be hosting that right in the centre sure. of London. It's great, uh, it's got great links to airports, there's uh, a good uh, um, hubbub of the creative community around, uh, so we're just by Liverpool Street for those that know London and uh, we're opening soon, we'd love to invite everybody to come and visit. Yeah, well congratulations on that and I uh, just want to thank you again for taking a few minutes to chat with me and enjoy the rest of the show. Very great pleasure, right. thank Thanks, you. Sam. I have uh, stopped by the Steinway booth here, and I'm joined by Lars and Thomas. Gentlemen, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, Good. enjoying Amsterdam? Definitely, yeah. Great, great. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me. I uh, uh, just had a demo of the product, uh, the new MP50, and uh, it sounded it sounded great. Um, really cool, really cool demo. I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about. There's obviously a ton of speaker manufacturers at these trade shows, and really give you an opportunity to help me understand what is it about Steinway that that makes you guys special. Well, I think the, it's the whole approach that we take. We don't look at the individual speaker. We look at the whole situation in your room. So when we make speakers, one of our philosophies is that we put the, the, the woofer in the corner, and that's to minimize reflections. So it's, it's not a subwoofer we put in the corner, but we, if you take a full range speaker and you take the bass out of it, you just put it in the corner. And normally that would destroy your frequency response, yep. but it makes a very good time response. And the frequency response we can correct in our DSPs. So I think that's one of the main differences. And of course, 
how we design the drivers, how sure. we design the, the voicing of the speakers. Uh, we usually use you know, very light uh, speakers, mm -hmm. so and we cross over very high as well. Okay, great. I know actually one of the big things they talked about during the MP50 demo is room perfect. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Well, room perfect is one of the biggest patterns in audio. Uh, what it does is it measures your the power response of the room. So it's not just you know a frequency sweep uh, as yep. others have done. Uh, so and it's fully automatic. So you follow a guide. It tells you what to do. It tells you when it's finished. You can always add more measurements later if you want to. But and then it calculates the filters. Done. You don't have to be yeah. an engineer to set it up. You don't have to know anything about it. And you can do it twice in a row and have the same effect, which is more than what you can say for for what we, sure. where we were 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So I think just really looking at audio as a more of a holistic uh, look at the room and figuring out again how to make that audio sound the best for the room that you're in, I think is obviously very important. And that was and something. It, and it's important to stress that it's a room correction. It's right. not a correction to make all speakers sound the same because you obviously bought your speaker because you like the sound of that speaker. Right. So it takes away the effect of the room and it doesn't you know, try to correct your speaker. Sure, sure. So in addition to the MP50, a couple of new speakers I believe you guys are showing here on the floor. I think it was the M112 and uh, or MH. MH2? Yeah, MH2 MH2 and the BW. Yeah, so we have two brands. We have the Steinway and Sons, and we have the Lungdorf Audio. Yep. And in the Lungdorf Audio, we sell component-based systems. So that means amplifiers and speakers you can combine with other brands. Yep. Whereas the Steinway is system-based. Everything you buy from us, you can't just buy one speaker. Yep. So in the Lungdorf Audio brand, we are introducing a BW2 and an MH2. Uh, the BW2 is an active uh, woofer. 10 inch with a 400 watt uh, amplifier in there, yep. developed by us. And uh, the MH2 is a mid high section, so it fits right into our philosophy about putting the woofer in the corner yeah. and having the mid high as a very small, uh, a nice speaker that Got it. your wife will also appreciate. Got it. Well, that's important. That's yeah. important. Uh, one last question. I'm going to go high level. <coughs> Excuse me, and Lars, maybe this better one for you. Uh, just in today's day and age with consumer electronics getting so commoditized and inexpensive, um, how important do you see high performance audio um, in today's world and, and, and as part of your guys' philosophy? Yeah, one of the, the things I have been thinking about is that all the young people are using headphones today to get a better sound of the iPhone or the smartphone they have today. Right. So I think they could bring that back to the home again. So I think this uh, in the future they also would like to buy uh, high-end uh, quality uh, audio and systems for the home yeah. in the future. So yeah. that's how I see it. It's a great experience and uh, I always enjoy when I sit in, into a really nice audio demo. It is, it is definitely different. Yeah, definitely. So. Thank you guys so much for taking a few minutes to chat with me and uh, good, luck, good luck with uh, what's left of the show here. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I am joined by Kevin over here at the Taurus Power Booth. Kevin, how's it going? It's going good, Jason. How are good. you? I'm doing great. Uh, awesome. Have you been enjoying the show? It's been a busy show for us, so great. this is always a good show for us to be attending. Yeah, yeah, that's good to hear. Well, I, I wanted to come by. This is, uh, I have to admit, not a, not a category that I've spent enough time uh, getting educated about. And I wanted to come by and learn a little bit about um, you know, what these products are really about. Um, sure. and, it's, and clearly, after my conversation with you, uh, it's re really more than just just a power conditioner, right? There's there's quite a bit that goes into this, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity to you know tell our listeners a little bit about how you see the category and where you guys fit in and what you do special. Sure, uh, and and you know the whole category is kind of considered to be a power conditioning category, but uh, the products that we make are actually very different. Uh, we we use an isolation transformer uh, in all of our products, so for us. This is really a power, a power isolation category rather than power conditioning. Uh, what, what makes a isolation different is you're actually, you're bringing in the voltage into a, a toroidal transformer and then through a primary and a secondary winding on the transformer, you're actually disconnecting the voltage path and using a magnetic solution to provide power to the, uh, to the equipment. So by doing that, you have the capability of, of, of doing a bunch of things also that benefit an audio video system. Uh, so you can actually uh, make sure that the voltage going to the system is the proper voltage uh, through uh, uh, using our transformers as a, a low pass filter 
We can filter out any noise that's on the line more effectively than you can in other systems and, and really provide the right power foundation for audio video systems. Yeah, yeah you, you talked about how that, that actually can make a, a measurable difference to the audio performance and you have, of course, uh, charts and things it, it that, can. that can illustrate that. You know, so what we typically hear and what we typically experience uh, when you're using an isolation transformer is the sound stage is going to change. So the sound stage will become wider and deeper. Uh, you'll hear a lot more of the, uh, the subtle dynamics in the music uh, yeah. because you're lowering the noise floor to a, a you know, large extent. So all of a sudden, the, the subtle uh, sounds and portions of the music become a lot more lively and, and evident. Uh, vocals uh, become more present in the music. And, and then the big thing for us with the isolation transformer is it's designed for dynamic capability. So when you're using it with an amplifier, you're going to hear a, a huge change in the bass attack and the performance of the amplifier. And, and that's what separates us from, from the whole category. Right. You know, typically you'd, you'd not really put an amplifier on a power conditioner because it'll restrict the dynamics of the amplifier. As a company, we've designed uh, power supplies for amplifiers for over 35 years. So what we've designed in the toroidal transformer, the isolation transformer, is actually something that'll work with the amplifier to provide more dynamic capability. Yeah. So it's really providing a better platform for the, for the amplifier to, to, to work. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, um, you know, reducing noise for the audio video systems is so important but if you're not doing it for the amplifier, then the amplifier is, is just amplifying the noise. Right. So that's really the, the most important piece that needs to, to have this type of uh, yeah. a foundation. Yeah. Speaking of noise, sounds like we got a party going on <laughs> next door here. Uh, but we're good. We'll keep going. Uh, one of the things that was interesting that you mentioned to me that I, I think a lot of people, myself included, don't necessarily think about with this sort of product is that it, it can actually help the reliability of, of systems as well, so control systems it come can. to mind. Talk about that for just it a second. Can, it can. We, we use a, a system, a voltage regulation system on many of our products where we're looking at uh, what's going on with the voltage in the environment. And uh, if the voltage is fluctuating in the environment, say it's going as low as 85 volts or maybe up to 135, uh, we take that and through a series of, uh, of different windings on the transformer, we actually use the transformer to adjust the voltage and output 120 volts to the equipment. So it may be changing in the environment, but the equipment won't see that. And, right. and when you're using some of these complex systems, a lot of microprocessors, uh, there are a lot of things that are sensitive to the voltage. Uh, if, you know, if you're providing the right voltage to, the, to, those, to all of that equipment, then your, your system will be much more reliable. You won't have the, the problems that come from drops in voltage, maybe voltage sags that sure. cause microprocessors to stop working, or, or when the voltage gets hot, maybe burning out some of the equipment. Yeah. So we tend to control that through our voltage regulation technology. Okay. Last question I wanted to ask you, um, I think there is a, a perception of these, I would classify them as high-end power solutions, um, but I think there may be a, a perception of these as being uh, universally expensive and really targeted at very high-end audiophile systems only. And uh, I'm learning here that that's, that's not the case. There are different solutions and, and sizes of these uh, transformers that you can put into all different types of, there are. of, of applications. So mm -hmm. touch on that for a second. Well, there are, and, and the way that we approach it is, is we approach it by, by making a, a wide range of solutions. Uh, anything from uh, a small 4 amp uh, transformer up to 300 amps and, and we, we try to take an approach of learning about the customer, finding out what the customer is using uh, for their equipment. We'll do a, a load calculation on, on what the power requirements are for all of that equipment and then we can provide a solution that's going to be matched perfectly to that equipment. So in some cases, uh, you know, a small integrated amplifier, uh, maybe a small receiver, we've got small solutions for that, but we can, we can go all the way up to multi-million dollar theaters with multiple racks of equipment and, and make sure that everything's using the same grounding point, the same phase of the electrical, yep. so everything's being run off of one uh, power foundation, and, and that really makes all the difference. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me and uh, enjoy what we have left of the show here. Thanks, Thank you Kevin. very much.
I'm here with Dominico at the Domots booth. How's it going? Hi, it's going great. Thank Good. you. Good yeah, seeing you. Show's winding down. Did you enjoy your time here in Amsterdam? Yeah. Well, I didn't see much of Amsterdam, but uh, it's, it's been you know four full days. is is it's really good. I'm going back on with a smile. Great. Great. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to chat with me. Um, I know you guys have a bunch of stuff going on. It's getting kind of hard to keep up with Domots and, and what you guys are doing. Um, so a couple of the big things that we've touched on. One of them is uh, is this new manufacturer support feature. You're working with a, a couple of different partners. So tell us about that. Yeah, we uh, just released the features uh, actually a week ago, where we are enabling a dealer to receive help from a manufacturer. Uh, we launched it together with Luxo, but we have uh, about a dozen other manufacturers that are soon coming on board. Essentially, it's a really, really easy to use feature. Uh, the, uh, the, the our system, our platform, term, uh, automatically identifies uh, the manufacturers that provide this feature and uh, let, enable them, enable the dealer to touch of a button to share the network with that manufacturer and to give them full access so they can get real help. And this is a great benefit for both the dealer and the manufacturer. Yeah, yeah, it really works. It really works well together to kind of streamline that that support process. And you showed me a little sample of it here. Let's yeah, go. yeah, and Let's we also screen. about there's some. Uh, added by the distributors uh, that are coming on board with that platform, so it's, it's getting really good reception. Got it, got it. One of the other things that I saw recently is a, a new partnership with D-Tools, I think you said is going to come online maybe sometime around April. Yep. And just talk about what that looks like. We are, uh, you know, we always try to focus on uh, on our users and, and uh, making it easy for them to use our system. Uh, the partnership with D-Tools goes uh, a long way in doing that, along with all our other efforts around uh, identifying devices. But uh, you know the, the, the initial moment, the initial experience. Whenever you set up uh, a Domot box or any device, is the configuration, and we want to make that really easy. So the partnership with Dtools allows a user to uh, utilize all the information they already have put inside Dtools in the spec of that job, and that should make uh, the setup of a Domot box really, really uh, easy and fast because you are just grabbing all the names and makes and models and uh, of those devices. Out right. Of just pushing a button, so it's, it's it's a great thing. Right, right. So you're mentioning, you know, the goal of that is to speed up configuration of systems. There's a second piece to that that's very relevant uh, with you guys and your acquisition of Fing a while back. And I understand there's been some uh, a lot of work going into that and talk about how that how that's going in, in the context of speeding up, you know, system deployment. Yeah, Fing is bringing a wealth of knowledge uh, into the Domot's world. It's uh, the, the application is really spreading like wildfire. We have uh, 30,000 downloads uh, every day. We have millions of users. Uh, and we, we launched the cloud features on Fing, which uh, allows for better uh, identification of devices. Uh, thanks to our users, we have now mapped uh, over 3 billion uh, uh, devices where we can tell you a MAC address, linking it to a type, a model number, and a brand. Uh, and that's extremely useful also in, uh, within the Domus uh, confines. So right. we, we're benefiting from, thanks to our users, to improving everybody's knowledge about what's out there. Got it. Got it. So well, once you have these devices all configured and hooked into the system, obviously you've got to you got to get the data out of them and have ways to monitor and manage them. And I know one of the things that you also mentioned you have coming up is is SNMP. Um, and so talk about that. Yeah, we um, have so far focused on really giving a, an awareness uh, into what's on the system and whether it's uh, it's 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 alive or not. Uh, we're going one step farther, both through integration into manufacturers and adding SNMP uh, monitoring of. Uh, custom OIDs, which is going to allow a user to monitor any variables uh, in their systems, whether it's temperature, CPU usage, uh, uh, memory, and uh, in order to allow them that, to understand whether a system is not just dead or alive, but if it's feeling well or not very well. Sure, sure. And last question here, I know you guys recently announced a, a consumer-facing app um, that allows end users to, to perform certain functions, and I understand there are some improvements coming to that shortly so what can you tell us about that yeah again we are uh, we, we conducted over 100 interviews uh, amongst our users uh, received a lot of feedback and uh, we are refining the user experience uh, uh, even more than it is right now by really focusing on the problems that a user might experience so um, you know the, the trick with all the any consumer facing application is to show less information but relevant information and to step into those user shoes so uh, we're gonna have a different user experience uh, that, that that comes in, which I think it's uh, we, which is really the, the result of of all our all the feedback that we received, and uh, you know we, we released functionality every two weeks. We were quite uh, quick in, in adapting and seeing uh, in, in refining uh, you know the experience for our customers. Great. Well, I really uh, appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to chat with me here, and wish you uh, safe travels back home. Thank you very much. Right, you thanks, too. Thank you. 
All right, I've got Ryan from Screen Innovations here. Ryan, how's it going? Awesome. Great, great. I love the booth here. Um, give our listeners, I'm sure most of them are very familiar with Screen Innovations, but just in case, uh, why don't you give us a quick introduction uh, to your company and what makes you guys unique? Absolutely. So uh, Screen Innovations started in my garage, literally. I still have metal shavings in my hair, <laughs> and uh, my hair stands straight up from all the glue that I used in the very yeah. beginning. <laughs> but uh, it's been nothing but fun, man. We're, uh, we're enjoying reinventing the industry and doing stuff that people never thought possible. Right. And uh, just trying to see around that corner and be more innovative uh, compared to how we were in the past. If you look at where TVs are going and you look at where LED light walls going, um, it's becoming very, very big and affordable very quickly. Yep. Um, but there's a lot of faults uh, that doesn't, basically you can't be creative with how you uh, display it or use it. So we've right. kind of always been controlled by where the TV goes in the room and our whole room follows. Yeah. So we're just trying to find a way around that and come up with new designs that allow people to actually be creative and do whatever they want with their image. Yeah, well, well speaking of being creative, we're standing here right in front of the new Transform screen and this thing is amazing I love it tell us about it yeah so transformer uh, was one of those things as well where we try to do the opposite of what the world is doing because yeah. we don't really like what the world's doing and uh, transformer just like zero edge when we when we invented zero edge we just realized that just because black diamond works with the lights on doesn't mean that it was going to be allowed to be in the living room right we call the velvet elvis frame velvet <laughs> elvis for a reason yeah. because it's just old school and it doesn't look cool well if you look at the masking screens that are out there they're two three feet deep they take a day and a half to install we want to cut yeah. that down to an hour and there's just no wow factor you're paying more money to cover up part of your screen and yeah. i just don't agree with that so yeah. transformer was born to make something that's absolutely beautiful make it simple and easy to install and i promise you every single customer that puts one in their house the first thing they're going to do is run down the street and grab their buddy yeah. and show it to them and guess what you did the install so you guys yeah. are going to get more business it's yeah, really definitely. cool it's it's very very cool i got a video that we'll be sure to put up on our website at hometech.fm uh, a couple other things you guys are showing here i know you've got uh, the zero g which is something you've been working on uh, for a while give us a give us the latest on that yeah, again, uh, motorized screens have been around for 100 years. Nothing's changed. Tap tensioning and things of that nature are kind of a staple. And uh, what we've discovered is with a motorized screen that you really can't put it anywhere you want. You're limited with drop and things of that nature. Plus, it just doesn't look cool. Yeah. So zero G was the, the goal was to levitate your image anywhere. And if you look again, you look at a television or a flat panel or anything of that nature, it dictates how you lay your room out. Yeah. And people buy a house. They spend a fortune on their view. Their glass is the most expensive part of the house, and they can't even face it. Yeah. You can't mount a flat panel in the middle of a window. Yeah. So Zero G was born to basically levitate an image anywhere, anytime. And what it's doing for the commercial market, as well as the residential market, we didn't even anticipate. Yeah. We just wanted to make something cool and to see how people are getting creative and actually using this product. It's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So one more question, and I think because I think this is an interesting story, we were just talking about it before we hit record here. The uh, the parachute cord. Tell us that anecdote. How absolutely. That came about. So zero G turned into a two year science project because we kept breaking cables. So we're we're very keen on cycling uh, and getting cycle tests out to twenty years plus. Yep. And. Uh, I came back from a trip, my wife took me on a, uh, a, a, a kiteboard trip, and I came back to the factory and it was on the ground again. And it literally was heartbreaking because we had spent about a year and a half trying to perfect this thing and get the cycle done. Yeah. At the same time, I was frustrated. It hit me like a ton of bricks. What about that parachute cord that drug me all over the yeah. place while kiteboarding? <laughs> Grabbed my entire engineering team, took them out in the parking lot, flew one of my starter kites in the parking lot, let my engineer grab it, drug him across the parking lot, <laughs> lifting him off the ground, and literally I crashed the kite and I pulled the Dyneema up and I yeah. said, what do you know about Dyneema? Yeah. So we start researching, sure enough, seven times stronger than steel, doesn't have all the tensile issues and the brittle issues that you get with cables over time. Instantly, we fixed it. It's great. And you know, it's just part of innovation. Everyone in the company thinks that way, and we're creative and innovative, and we just have a good time, and that's how we end up where we are. Awesome. It's just great. Yeah. Well, I love it. I really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to chat with me, and uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Absolutely, man. All Thank right. you, Jason. Appreciate it.